What does it mean that Noah's Ark is a type of the rapture? We'll talk about it. Why would we even talk about the, the story of Noah now? Well, it brings us to what Christ said in his um, in his Olivet Discourse. And basically, Jesus was telling his disciples, here's, here's what's going to happen at the end of time. Uh, these are the things that will lead up to my uh, second coming. And one of the things he said was, it will be just like it was in the days of Noah. So that's why we have to go back to find out what was going on in Noah's day. Welcome to Understanding the Times Radio with Jan Markell, Radio for the Remnant, brought to you by Olive Tree Ministries. Today, Jan talks to author Jeff Kinley. They contrast the days of Noah with our generation as the Bible says the last days will be as the days of Noah. Just what does that mean? How do we see that playing out? And what are the consequences when warnings are ignored? Here is today's programming. We are living in the days of Noah. When we look at what happened in the time of Noah and what is going to happen or what is already happening in the world, we will see that there are parallels between these two. The story of Noah is like a shadow of what is going to happen in the last days. How do we know this? Jesus already told us in the Bible about it. Matthew 24, 37 through 39, KJV. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. What Jesus was telling us here is that the last days will be exactly like in the days of Noah people will be living their normal lives. And look at the world today. People are living their normal lives without one concern of God or eternity. The motto of this world is eat, drink, and be merry, and not a single thought of the judgment of the Lord. If you want to know the things that will happen in the last days, then you need to know the story of Noah. On the last day, there will also be two categories of people, those who will be saved and those who will perish. There is nothing that can change that. Now, the question I want to ask you is, which category do you want to be in? Well, I'm glad you could join me today for Understanding the Times Radio. And we often hear about the unspeakable days of Noah in the Bible. Noah, the only righteous man on a planet that likely had several billion people? Really? We hear that our modern generation is as the days of Noah. What does that mean? What are some of these comparisons? Well, we might look at those this hour. My guest for the hour thinks so and has written a book about it that we carry, as it was in the days of Noah, warnings from Bible prophecy about the coming global storm. So what is this global storm? Perhaps we can already hear the rattle of the thunder as it approaches. Are you ready? What about the turmoil we are now seeing in America, even in the church? We've got school shootings, we've got political turmoil, we've got wars, natural disasters that are setting all sorts of new records. And not pretty records, by the way. We've got economic woes. We've got inflation, economic uncertainty, digital currency on the horizon. How do these things relate to the days of Noah and our modern times? Can we grasp the gravity of the depravity of Noah's day and our day? I want to play one more clip before I bring my guest Jeff Kinley on because this particular clip talks about how sin dominating our world today just as it dominated Noah's day and no one is shocked about it. What are the parallels between Noah and the end times? Number one, the prevalence of sin and evil in the world. In the time of Noah, sin was great. Sin was exalted. In our generation, sin is exalted. Sin is worshiped. In the days of Noah, the only thing that mankind could think of was sin. God himself saw how great sin had become. Men, women, adults, and children were sinning. Genesis. 6 5 through 6 KJV. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. This is the same thing that is happening in our time. Sin has become the order of the day. Sin has taken over that if you are not sinning, you will be seen as the odd one. People sin to please other people. People sin to have a sense of achievement. People sin for unjustifiable reasons. Just as sin became prevalent in the time of Noah, sin is now dominating in the world. 
If you hear the things happening in the world today, you will be shocked. There are some Christians who live in a bubble in a sense. They live a very quiet life. They go to work and go to church and that's it. And they don't know the level of sin this world has reached. Things that are quite literally unimaginable is now happening in the world. The Bible revealed to us that in the last days, perilous times shall come. Aren't we in the perilous times? 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5 mentioned things that will happen when these perilous times come. They are things we are seeing in the world right now. They are things that happened in the time of Noah that led the world into destruction. 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. We're going to talk about these issues and a lot more. Jeff Kinley is an author of 40 books. He's host on his channel, Christian TV. Our Understanding the Times Radio also airs, by the way. He is co-host on the Prophecy Pros podcast with Todd Hampson. Jeff Kinley, welcome back to the program. Jan, great to be back with you. Oh, I have so many comments and notes in front of me, Jeff. You call the time period that we're talking about, we're looking back now at the days of Noah, a Mardi Gras on steroids. The whole planet hated the Creator. How does a society devolve like this, and how on earth did one man remain so righteous? And you talk about all of this in this wonderful book that I'll say more about later, but can you comment on this? How on earth can society, in other words, billions of people and only one righteous man? Well, it just speaks to the depravity of man. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, the heart is deceitfully wicked above all things. Who can even know it? Who can understand it? Left to ourselves, Jan, we devolve. Man never gets better on his own. He might create cures for diseases and go to the moon, but he can never become better morally. So what happens is in Noah's generation, as in ours, once we've pushed God to the margins, as it says in Romans chapter one, we're basically left to ourselves and to our own futile speculations. And from that, there is this downward spiral that begins to gather steam, just like a snowball going down a hill. And pretty soon the momentum of immorality and godlessness on the planet becomes so large that it's undeniable. And so everyone is really caught up into that vortex. I want to read what you say on page 11 of As It Was in the Days of Noah, warnings from Bible prophecy about the coming global storm. And you write this, it's quite simple yet profound. You say a flood is coming. God is going to destroy this earth, including you, unless you repent. This was the core of Noah's message, simple, to the point, no beating around the bush. The preacher's sermon was plain, straightforward, and even uses an object lesson to illustrate the message's main point, the building of a very big boat. Noah's audiovisual sermon lasted 120 years, and you go on to say, and then the flood came and destroyed them all, just like that. But there's a bit more to this story. While describing the flood drama, what is often lacking amid tales of the old man in the ark, its animal kingdom occupants, and the terrible water judgment is how God felt about the whole affair. We know it in the end. He brought judgment, but we fail to mention that the catastrophic event that annihilated mankind initially flowed not from a furious fist, but from a broken heart. God's spirit was grieved. He actually experienced sorrow an unusual concept to contemplate, particularly in the context of judgment. But there are facets of God's relationship with humankind that affect him emotionally, bringing lament and regret to his spirit. That's because God isn't some stoic, emotionless, distant deity, but rather a father who feels. I'm so glad you included that in the opening few pages of your book, Jeff. I don't think too many people stop to think that God was clearly grieved by what he had to do. Absolutely. In fact, it's a juxtaposition of judgment and mercy, judgment and grace. God knew in order to save humanity, he would first have to destroy it and then rebuild again through one righteous man, the man Noah. And so as we trace that whole narrative, Jan, of Noah's story, we really have made it either into a children's story of just giraffe heads sticking out of a boat all the way up to just saying, well, it was all about judgment and nothing else. And yet we forget the fact that God is the main character of the story, and his heart was actually broken. It grieves the heart of God to have to bring judgment on humanity, and yet this was what was needed because of the depth of the depravity. Well, it's coming again in the tribulation time, which we're not quite there in our discussion yet, but 
all of this is foreshadowing what is coming in that terrible tribulation period. I want to play one more clip, and then I want to come back and talk to you about Noah himself. They were consumed by the cares of this world. They were so absorbed, engrossed, and captivated by the cares of this world, so much so, they ignored the warnings of the prophet. The people of Noah's generation were busy, busy, busy eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, and the world will do that to you. It will, it will suck you in to make you too busy for God. The world has such a way to get you so soaked up into this life that you forget about the fact that Jesus is coming soon. Jesus will come when people are going on with their normal business. People will be doing what they always do. People will be involved in their normal everyday activities, not realizing such a momentous event is about to occur. The return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Those who live in sin will still be living in sin. Those who seek and chase after righteousness will be seeking and chasing after righteousness. This is why holy living is so important, because the day of reckoning is coming, and the world at large, just like the world during the days of Noah, are all heading towards this reckoning. The primary concern of Matthew chapter 24 verses 37 through 39 is highlighting the fact that people will be carrying on their daily business, ignoring God's warnings, just as people did in the days of Noah. But just as the flood was God's means of judgment on those people, so Jesus' return will bring judgment on sinners and salvation to his people. Jeff, I want to talk about Mr. Noah here for a moment because blameless in his time, he was 480 years old at the time, and he unmistakably heard God's voice, and he never questioned it. And he may have questioned his assignment, but he did not question the word that was giving the assignment. Describe the blueprint for the ark. 522 standard railroad cars sealed with pitch. An amazing feat in Noah's day when you consider there's no Home Depot, yeah. there are no power tools, there are no huge construction crews to call upon. Noah essentially was left to himself. Now, we don't know if his sons were able to help him out at some point or he had some other relatives around him, but basically building anything of that size in that time would be a Herculean task. And this boat was 450 feet long and 45 feet high and 75 feet wide. Obviously it took a long time to do. But can you imagine, Jan, going out to the forest every day and sawing down trees, yeah. chopping down trees, hauling them back to the job site, beginning to hewn them, to strip them of their bark, sawing them up, putting them into place, making notches. All of these things Noah did by hand. So Noah's faith was a very long walk of obedience. It was a daily kind of faith. And yet he didn't come to that faith, Jan, by himself. As we look at Scripture and we look at Genesis chapter 5, we find out that Noah came from a godly heritage. His was a grounded faith. He had a legacy, a lineage of faith. He had men who had come before him who had passed on the truth of God to him. In fact, we know that his father was a man by the name of Lamech, who was a godly man who prophesied even about Noah himself, his grandfather, was, of course, Methuselah, who lived to be 969 years. Then, of course, Enoch, who was so godly that the Bible says the Lord just took him to heaven. If you think about it, Noah's life wasn't an accident. It was a fate that had been faithfully passed down like a baton mm -hmm. to him. The result is, in the midst of all of this society that is literally soaked in sin, there is this one righteous man that is blameless in his time, and God tapped him on the shoulder and said, I want you to do something very bizarre, but also very difficult that'll take a long time to complete. And Noah said, yes, Lord. The other thing very unusual, Jeff Kinley, is it never rained. No wonder people laughed at him. I don't think they knew what rain was. No, in fact, Genesis tells us, Genesis chapter 2, and verse 6, that a mist used to rise from the earth and water the whole surface of the ground. And many people believe there was a protective water canopy that filtered out the sun's harmful ultraviolet rays. And that would explain one reason why mankind lived as long as he did. Yeah, it never rained. So think about Noah is bringing to his generation a message that sounds unbelievable. And so it brought him surely a lot of mocking, ridicule, saying surely the Lord's not going to come and bring judgment. 
They mocked him. They mocked God. This was 120 years of intense labor, as you said, and intense preaching. Talk about a preacher who had no response. Many pastors listening to this, and they have very little response. They can identify a little bit here with Noah. Jeff, I wonder about communication at that time, because it's estimated that there were several billion, perhaps eight, nine billion people on the planet at that time. No communication, no internet, no TV, no computers, no radio, no YouTube. How on earth did the message get spread across to these billions of people that Noah was doing what he was doing and saying what he was saying? No communication, no tools like we have today. It makes sense that humanity was a little bit more concentrated at that time. Surely they were spread out to some degree, but they were indeed population of up into the billions, eight or nine billion. But you think about that Noah is building this ark. I believe it was Charles Spurgeon that once said, if you want to draw a crowd, set yourself on fire and people just come to watch you Mm -hmm. burn. And Noah was building this huge ark. I don't know if people even knew what a boat was. And so he's building this thing, Jan. I talk about in the book how they must have called it Noah's Folly. Or Here's the crazy old lunatic building this monstrosity there. So I think the ark itself was surely an attraction. It was sort of a novelty. But Peter tells us that Noah was also a preacher of righteousness. When he wasn't working on the ark, he was preaching about this judgment to come. And so God had really multiple levels of warning people about that coming global storm. Going back to Methuselah, we learned that Methuselah's name originally meant, when he is gone, it shall come, or his death shall bring it. And all of Methuselah's life was a preaching tool. Every time someone said the name Methuselah, they were prophesying about the flood. And the Bible tells us in Genesis that in the very year that Methuselah died, the floodgates opened. So when he died, it indeed came. You're listening to Understanding the Times Radio. I'm Jan Markell. I have on the line from Little Rock, Arkansas, Jeff Kinley, because we carry, well, quite frankly, carry a number of his books, and I'll give you the names of the others. But the one we're featuring, this program, and the one I'm emphasizing because I love the content, as it was in the days of Noah, warnings from Bible prophecy about the coming global storm. We're talking about Well, the assignment that Noah had so many millennia ago, that he was the only righteous man in his generation, the mocking that he endured, both Noah, quite frankly, they mocked God at the same time. The world was godless. My question, Jeff Kinley, did they even have a conscience left? Had they degraded that much? Sin was their only means of functioning. So perhaps their conscience was seared back then. I believe it was, Jan. In fact, back to Genesis chapter 6, verse 5, it says, Then the Lord saw the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Mm -hmm. Jan, I have trouble wrapping my mind around that concept, that every human being was just completely filled with wickedness. They were soaked with sin. Every molecule of their mind was just concentrated on how can I please myself and serve myself What's crazy is, is that today I look around and I see people just, as Romans 1 says, inventors of evil. We're coming up with new ways to invent evil. I mean, even a minor example is the way that they are promoting the mutilation of children with this gender reassignment surgery. Who would have thought, even just a few years ago, that our own government, our president, and the powers that be in our country would be promoting this and telling us that we are sinful for trying to keep this from happening. Not only destroying children in the womb, but also mutilating them as young children. I think you go back to the days of Noah, you think about the mind of man. Noah was a very intelligent man. It took sin a while to completely corrupt the human mind. Men were creating buildings and projects. So when you get to Genesis chapter six, certainly mankind used that same creativity, that same sense of depravity to seek new ways to sin. That's why verse 5 was written, and that's why the very next verse says the Lord was very grieved for it. Play one more clip this segment. This particular clip is talking about, well, people were caught unaware in the days of Noah. They're going to be caught unaware again because Jesus Christ is going to come back, and many, many people are going to be caught completely unaware, even though they've been warned, just as they were warned during Noah's generation. The generation of Noah that disbelieved the possibility of a flood didn't stop the flood from taking them unaware. 
It came in a time they never expected. They had the opportunity to get into the Ark and become safe from the Flood. But they chose to turn deaf ears to the words of Noah. They could not blame God for being heartless. They only had themselves to blame. For being unwise in their decisions because they all had the choice to get into the Ark. And oh, the Flood came. Imagine how they felt when they heard thunder roar and the lightning flash. And that first drop of rain came. They all thought of Noah as the floodgates of heaven poured. And as water began to pour out of the ground and they tried to swim as fast as they could, they climbed mountains trying to get to higher ground. The day the flood came they were all caught unaware. This is the same way Christ will show up one day and people will be caught unaware. Those years it took before God finally vented his anger on the people. They would have taken him for granted and some would have made mockery of Noah. But when the time of patience elapses, it will be the turn of humans to beg God. Unfortunately, it may be too late to obtain mercy. Luke 17, 26 through 27 says, and as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and the flood came, and destroyed them all. You're listening to Understanding the Times Radio. On the line, Jeff Kinley. You can learn more at jeffkinley.com, Main Thing Ministries, jeffkinley.com. Basing my conversation for the hour on the book as it was in the days of Noah, warnings from Bible prophecy about the coming global storm. Jeff, I'm just reading another paragraph that you've written here. You're referring here to Noah. You say, surely he lay in bed some nights during those 120 years, wide awake, with throbbing back pain, gashed leg, or swollen and bruised knuckles, wondering, God, is all this really worth it? Is this flood really going to happen, or did I imagine it? Is my boat going to float, or will I sink and drown like the rest? Did you really speak to me all those years ago, or am I wasting my time and my life? Are the skeptics and the cynics right in what they say about me? Will I be proved a fool? Is this the only way you can save us? Isn't there any easier way for you to accomplish your will? Now, you made that conversation up, but I thought it was profound. Yeah, you think about Noah. I mean, just put feet on the Scripture here and to think into what was really going on. In fact, when we read Scripture, Jan, we need to immerse ourselves into the text anyway and just look around and go, what must have been going on in Noah's life? And I think, obviously, as he's going through these type of experiences, he wanted to please God. He wanted to serve God. But his faith was a weathered faith. Noah had calluses on his yeah. hands. And thousands and thousands of days he spent working on this thing long bouts, surely because he's a human being, bouts with doubt, bouts with discouragement, bouts with loneliness. But he chose to believe God over a long period of time. It may have cost him relationships. It may have cost him whatever business he may have had in that day. But God's call on his life meant that he had to get dirty. He had to do the hard thing, that there were no easy road. He had to be willing to bleed, to have scars. Today, we want the perks with no pain. That's we want right. success with no sacrifice. But Jesus said, your faith in this world will mean sacrifice. They will mock your belief in Jesus and his return. And I would venture to say right now, Jan, there are people listening that are asking themselves, like Noah, did I imagine this whole Bible prophecy thing? Did I imagine the rapture? Was I wrong about the tribulation coming and the second coming and heaven and hell? Did I misread God here? Because we're outnumbered billions to one, like yeah. Noah was. Yeah. So we walk a very narrow path. We carry a message that is unpopular, that people do not want to hear, and therefore they're trying to choke out the message of prophecy, the message of the gospel. And so like Noah, we have to keep picking up that hammer and going to work every day and continuing to persevere in our faith. And I guess that's one thing, Jan, I would say I admire most about Noah is that there was nothing casual about his faith. You can't fake an ark. Yeah. People can fake their Christianity, but you can't fake an ark. He just got up every day, went to work, was committed to doing what God had called him to do. 
Well, as you say, ours is a generation of quick fixes. So true. You called it the microwave generation. And how could this even happen today? What we're describing here and what the Bible describes seems unthinkable. One more thought here before we go into part two of my programming, but I think one of the amazing facts is God brought the animals. Somehow he gave them the instinct to find Noah, perhaps over hundreds, perhaps even thousands of miles to the very location of the ark. What must the onlookers have thought? What about wild flesh-eating beasts? They must have suddenly settled down for this little journey to the ark and even on the ark. But can you imagine these heathens who are watching all of this and suddenly two by two, these animals come strolling right up to Noah. I cannot picture, my imagination can't quite fill everything in. Well, it's a supernatural event, I believe, that God drew the animals in. But here's another thing to think about too, is that as people watch those animals surely make their way toward the ark, it's really kind of a judgment on humanity again. It's kind of a prejudgment saying, even the animals know to obey God. You're not even connecting with God as much as the animal kingdom is. So where does that place you? Today, I mean, we're seeing the simplicity of just believing in Jesus is so simple, but at the same time, people want to shun it. Like you said, they want to be distracted and diverted to other desires. So I think that the animals coming to the ark being a supernatural thing was also a way to tell humanity, look, you better get on board because even the animals know what's coming. Even the animals know what's coming. And I want to get to a comment or two in part two of my programming. What is going on in America, in the world, even in the church? But we've got school shootings. We've got political turmoil. We've got natural disasters that are setting all sorts of new records. We've got economic woes, inflation, digital currency on the horizon. My hunch is God's trying to get a message to us. The world is literally in every kind of turmoil you can imagine, including weather turmoil. I'm coming back in just a minute or two. Don't go away. Again, talking to Jeff Kinley, jeffkinley.com, as it was in the days of Noah. I think this story alone, the story of Noah, is one of the most remarkable in the Bible. And it was a day when one person warned of judgment. Today, the church is warning that judgment is coming. And again, most of the world ignoring the warnings coming right back. Don't go away. When you look at Romans chapter 8, Jimmy, the Bible talks about how the creation itself is groaning for redemption. Uh, The whole earth is just saying, gosh, I'm I'm just tired of being here and (laughs) it needs to be remade. And so uh, that's, I think that's one of the things we're seeing right now. And of course, uh, just like birth pangs, these things do increase with intensity and frequency. And so I think we're seeing with with nature itself, I mean, you're seeing storms uh, being uh, you know, produced and, and going across the planet and, and all sorts of catastrophes and nationwide disasters and things like that. But yeah, I do think these earthquakes uh, are increasing. And of course, uh, there's going to be a giant earthquake on the Mount of Olives when Jesus Christ touches his foot down there, uh, Zechariah chapter 12 tells us. So, so yeah, there's going to be an increase, I believe, in these things as we approach the end times. And welcome back. I am talking for the hour with author Jeff Kinley. You can learn more at jeffkinley.com. We carry several of his books. We're talking about as it was in the days of Noah this hour, but we carry his book, Aftershocks, Christians Entering the New Age of Global Crisis. And then we carry the book that I think is covering another hugely important topic, Global Reset. He co-authored that with Mark Hitchcock, Do Current Events point to the Antichrist and his worldwide empire. You can find all of these in my online store, olivetreeviews.org, olivetreeviews.org. You can call my office. You can get on our newsletter lists where we often post these books. We charge no shipping at all in the U.S. and Canada if you'd like to look into any of these products or any of the other products in our online store. Say, if you are a fan of social media, we're on all sorts of platforms. We remain on Facebook, Jan Markell's Olive Tree Ministries, Instagram, Olive Tree Ministries, Gab under Jan Markell. Find us on YouTube at Olive Tree Ministries or Jan Markell, but look for subscribers. It's about 206,000 subscribers. There are lots of fake accounts. On Rumble at Olive Tree Ministries, on Telegram at Olive Tree Ministries, on Twitter, at Olive Tree Men, and on Truth Social, at Olive Tree Views. Well, we might add some, we might even take some off, but for now, those are our social media platforms, and I hope you'll enjoy dialoguing with one another on these platforms. And let me just give a quick heads up here that we are just off of our Understanding the Times. 
with Mondo Gonzalez, the Prophecy Watchers, and we had a fantastic turnout and online audience, and you can watch all or part of it on our website, olivetreeviews.org, olivetreeviews.org. Go to video. You can order a DVD of the evening, just about $10. Allow a couple of days for that to hit our online store. You can call my office. Coming up in April is Alex Newman. In June is Dr. Mark Hitchcock. And in August is Michelle Bachman. So that's a lineup here for the next few months anyway here in the new year. We've been talking for the first part of the program about the uniqueness of Noah as it was in the days of Noah, warnings from Bible prophecy about the coming global storm. One of the most intriguing books I've read simply because I felt it got into the mind of Noah and the incredible assignment that he was given and the incredible mocking. And he was trying to warn the world, judgment is coming. Well, the church is trying to warn the world right now, judgment is coming. And you can escape that judgment, obviously, through Jesus Christ, through an imminent rapture. Or if you perish before the rapture, you will be dwelling with the Lord Jesus Christ in eternity in heaven. Jeff, let me just go back here quickly to the scenario with Noah. He preached his last sermon. He was warning, hoping for repentance and salvation, and then the door slammed. And we've heard some of these clips, and my goodness, the panic that must have ensued among billions of people. Noah was right. And then the rain begins. They didn't even know what rain was, as we said in part one. And all of a sudden, the deluge, and we got to clarify, the deluge is not just rain. The deluge comes from the opening of the deep as well. Can you just explain that for a moment? The Bible says that there are great fountains of the deep that came bursting forth in that day. And just recently, there was a report I read. In fact, I have this documented in the book. In the Science Journal of 2014, geophysicists discovered a hidden ocean 400 miles beneath the Earth's surface, three times larger than all of the world's oceans combined. And that confirms to me, Jan, Genesis 7, 11, when it says the fountains of the great deep yes. opened. God always predates what man discovers. The flood itself was a violent act. It was not just it's going to rain, the waters are going to rise. There were geysers bursting up out of the earth all over the world and covered the earth completely. The Bible says in Genesis 7, verse 16, that God himself was the one that shut the door. So if you can imagine the sheer panic, the horror, the realization of thinking he was right. Mm -hmm. That moment is what every person feels the second they die and wake up in hell without Jesus Christ. Those Christians were right. The Bible was right. When we look at this judgment, God destroyed everything that breathed air. That's men, women, and children. Mm -hmm. And if you want to talk about the righteousness of God, when we think about the holiness of God, the righteousness of God, we have to understand that God's judgment falls on everyone that actively refuses to believe the truth. So the flood came and it destroyed them all. Some might be asking what kind of a God would do this. And I think you've already explained that. But I think that's a question that natural man would think. It's going to happen again during that terrible tribulation time. Do you think the people of Noah's day, and again, now they see they were wrong, and they see the rain and the fountains of the deep, do you think they understood the gravity of their depravity? I think in that moment they did, because when God reveals his righteousness, there's a natural understanding, like when we read the word as a mirror, it looks into our soul, that they understand that. I think when people wake up in hell, they understand, I'm a sinner, because of that conscience that had been seared and they had suppressed the truth of God in unrighteousness for so many years, that veil is lifted in that moment. So I think everyone in Noah's generation felt that. But also, Jan, you think about what kind of God would do this. And I talk about this in the book, how it's the same God that gave men 120 years to repent. It's the same God who created a person named Methuselah, whose every time his name was mentioned, it was a preaching of the judgment to come. The same God that gave them conscience. The same God that led a man to build an ark for people to get on. The same God today, the Bible says in 2 Peter 3, 9, the Lord is not slow concerning his promise, but is patient towards men, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So it's the same God that's waiting today. And finally, it's the same God that sent his son, Jesus Christ, to provide a covering for our sin and completely rid us of the curse of sin in our lives. That God offers that salvation today. So this wasn't climate change. 
this was the wrath of God, just as the tribulation seals, bowls, trumpets. They won't be climate change, folks. They are the wrath of God. Jeff, creation has always been groaning, but I think I asked you, is creation groaning a little bit more here in these final days? It certainly appears so. And obviously we have no chapter and verse that points to individual types of catastrophic climate events. But when these events happen, we look at these things and creation is groaning. The earth itself is saying, I want to be remade. So we're seeing the effects, of course, initially the effects of sin that have been rippling throughout mankind. But as we get closer to the prophecies of Revelation being fulfilled, I think what we're seeing is a little bit more previews of what's to come. You mentioned that Noah's story was not climate change. Tribulation is not going to be climate change. It's going to be God bringing catastrophic judgment and change to the earth. And these type of events, not to downplay any of what people need to do in their own lives in terms of recovering, but these things really cause us to look up, or at least they should, to say, hey, my life is temporary. I could go at any moment. My possessions are not important. What's really important is my soul. Jesus said, take care of your soul. That's the most important thing that we can do. I think these things do get our attention, but they're going to appear with more acceleration as we get closer to the time of rapture. Amen. Yes. I'm play one more clip. It's you and Jimmy Evans. And here you are expounding further on our topic of the hour. I love it that you bring out the fact, even though it's a tough concept to wrap our minds around, that God was sorry that he made man. And that is how corrupt and depraved mankind was during the days of Noah. How does that happen? And that really goes back to Romans 1. If we've ever seen a world like the days of Noah, this is it, isn't it? <laughs> it really is. I mean, you think about just what's going on in the world today, and then you go back to your Bible and you go, wait a minute, I feel like I'm reading today's headlines happening right in front of me. So, yeah, yeah it really is mirroring the days of Noah. Well, what do you think, like specifically, and I know in your book you talk about a lot of the things that are happening. You know, people people look at Noah kind of like a children's story. You know, we teach our kids about Noah and the flood and things like that. But really, this is a terrifying thing. What, what happened in the days of Noah and what's about to happen in the world, it's really terrifying when you look at it from that perspective. Well, it is. It was the apocalypse of that day, Jimmy. Right. It, it happened uh, to the point to where God wiped out the entire planet. In fact, when you go back to Genesis, we have to really go back to Genesis to see what the days of Noah were really like. And when we do that, we find that uh, God said that he was sorry that he made man. Yeah. He was sorry that he even created mankind because uh, he, they had become so de corrupt and so depraved and so uh, debauched that the Bible says that every single thought was only evil continually. Wow. And God knew that the only way he was going to save humanity was eventually he'd have to wipe them out and basically start over again. So that's what he did through the worldwide flood. And you're right. It's not a, a playtime nursery story that really we tell kids unless we include the whole story which is uh, God had to bring a massive apocalyptic judgment on humanity in order to, uh, to bring about a righteous remnant. Jeff Kinley, let's talk about how this happens because it is happening as we speak, and that is the depraved mind, Romans 1. A hardened heart cannot make sound judgment, cannot reason. In a sense, a hardened heart, if I can be blunt, is dumbed down. And the difference as we speak, of course, Christians are here. The church is here. That's not going to be forever. As a matter of fact, we could go today, tomorrow, any minute. But let's talk about Romans 1 for just a moment. Romans 1 really lays out the pattern that we're seeing unfold in our culture today. It begins with simply knowing that there is a God, which every human being does know that God exists because he displayed his divine attributes and power in the heavens and in nature and creation. But when we choose not to recognize God as creator and we suppress that truth and unrighteousness, God essentially says around verse 19 to verse 20 that he's going to turn the lights down on our mind. We will lose the ability to be able to understand reality. And so it says we begin to be futile in our speculations. And that word futility means nonsense. We invent nonsense and we pursue nonsense. That leads to worshiping the creation which is what we're seeing right yes, now with yes. this whole climate change chaos thing going on and that whole hoax that's happening. That then leads to worshiping more of the creature rather than the creator. And then, Jan, it just takes a nosedive into complete sexual immorality, 
homosexual perversions with lesbianism and homosexuality, and now, of course, the transgender thing. Finally, God just says three times in that passage, he gives them over, and it's the Greek word paradidomai, which essentially means to release someone to their own arrest. So God pushes them in that direction because they've earned it, just like he hardened Pharaoh's heart after Pharaoh hardened his own heart. So we invent new gods, new philosophies. There's rampant hedonism, the pursuit of pleasure, sexual perversion, unnatural human activity. It's spiritual insanity. It's moral anarchy. And then at the end of that passage, Jan, it says they celebrate sin. They dance in the streets for sin. Back to Noah, we see this unrestrained immorality happening back as far as Genesis 6-2 with these demonic unions with mortal women. It talks about them being corrupt there. The same author, Moses, uses that word corrupt in Exodus 32 to talk about the sexual orgy that's going on at the base of Mount Sinai. And of course, today we've got sex trafficking, sex slavery, mainstream acceptance of homosexuality and lesbianism. The number of people identifying as either homosexual or transgender has doubled in our country since 2012. What I find very interesting, and I did in my research for this book, Jan, is when you look at what the ancient Jewish scribes wrote. In fact, during the intertestamental period, some of the ancient Jewish scribes wrote in the Midrash, which is an exegesis of the Torah, they believed that tradition says marriage contracts were written between homosexuals in Noah's day, that even songs were composed for such ceremonies. Then they said that when such sin was no longer recognized as sin by civilization, that that civilization lost its right to exist and was therefore deservingly swept away by God in the great flood. As Justice Samuel Alito said in 2015, when we sanctioned homosexual marriage, he says, I don't think in the history of civilization we've ever officially sanctioned homosexual marriage. And he was right. Perhaps not since the days of Noah. So what does that say about our culture, our generation, as compared to Noah's? You write that there were 50 shades of immorality back then and certainly today. But another thing that there's a parallel here, and that is this whole business as usual mentality back then, which we see going on today. People just think life is going to go on. We're going to have another election in 2024. We're going to turn things around. We're going to make America great again, and maybe we will. I don't know the plan of God nor his timing. I do kind of question that. But again, this business as usual, this life will go on. We're going to continue to enjoy life as much as we can. That's true. It's indicative of our culture when you think about the fact that the average person spends anywhere from five to seven hours a day on their phone in some capacity. There are distractions, there are diversions, there are desires, and there are deceptions. Those four things are keeping us from thinking about the one thing that matters the most. And then when we do face that, many people in our culture are scoffing and mocking the very truth that God brings. So yeah, just like in the days of Noah, giving in marriage, living in their lives, business is normal. You ask if one can actually reach a point where they cannot be saved. I think we've probably answered that question this hour. The scripture answers the question. Yeah. When we see in Second Thessalonians chapter 2, Verse 10 through 12, where in the tribulation, God himself will send a spirit of delusion that they might believe the lie of Antichrist. We see it in Romans chapter 1, where God does give us over. We're experiencing right now God's abandonment wrath on our planet, yeah, yeah. just as we were in the days of Noah. As you relate in a discussion of the rapture, let's clarify here. I mean, I think a huge point that we're trying to make this hour is that the ark is really a type of the rapture. I think we need to expand that discussion here for a few minutes because we can't change what happened in Noah's day. We can change what's happening in our individual life. We can't really change much of what's going on in the world. It is out of control. It's going to get more and more out of control. As I said, we've got shootings. We've got weather out of control. We've got economic issues that are staggering. We've got corruption. We've got political intrigue. Some of it's just heartbreaking. But what is coming is obviously the rapture of the church, and there is a parallel here to the days of Noah, and I think we need to focus on that for a few minutes as we wind down. I think so. The ark is a type of Christ because the ones that were inside the ark were lifted up out of the danger of God's judgment. They weren't under the water going through it, but not drowning. They weren't like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fire, but protected in it. No, they were taken out of it. Just as Revelation 3.10 says that the church at Sardis will be taken out of the time of testing that's about to come upon the whole world. 
So I think it's important for people to understand that when we look back at these historic biblical events, that these serve as lessons for us. They're mm-hmm. examples for us. Just like we look back at the Titanic and said, hey, how can we build ships better? How yeah. can we navigate better? How can we have SOS for ships, better lifeboats? We need to learn from the story of Noah Because I think the rapture, Jan, is going to be the final judgment before the tribulation judgment. All these things are leading towards the one judgment of the rapture, that when we're left, we leave this earth, nothing's going to be left behind that is of any good and of any type of godliness. So the restrainer's gone, salt and light are gone. God has said, this is what you wanted, this is what you get. People are cursing God, and they are headed to a godless eternity, some anyway. Many are repenting, many are not talking about this tribulation period. Again, God's grace abounds during that tribulation time. The gospel is going to be preached to the ends of the earth during the tribulation. We've got the two witnesses, the 144,000 Jewish witnesses. We've got an angel preaching the gospel. Millions are going to come to faith, sort of unlike Noah's day. I think that's where this is a huge difference between Noah and the tribulation. Yeah, and when you think about the fact that when we're taken up in the rapture, people are left behind. But God's grace is still in effect. Yes. Uh, There's going to be a massive revival take place. And once again, it just blows your mind to think about how loving and merciful. If it were one of us, we'd say, hey, you had your chance. That's it. But of course, these believers are going to pay with their lives for their faith. But yes, as you said, there's going to be multiple ways and levels and parallels of the ways God is going to give the gospel during that time with the two witnesses, 144,000, an angel preaching in midheaven tracks and programs like this sure. left behind the, the witness that's in the hearts and minds of people that they'll realize, hey, they were right, fall on their knees, come to Christ. But again, they're going to go through those horrific times of judgment and better to get on board now and miss it all. You made a statement in your book, which I'm quoting here, that mankind does not really get better. It's going to require a savior. I thought that's really profound. We've got the corruption of Noah's day. We've got the corruption of modern day. We've got the corruption of all humanity for all time. What it requires really is a savior. It does, Janet. And even during the tribulation, humanity doesn't get better. They don't respond to the judgments of God positively. You begin in chapter six, they're hiding from God. Chapter nine, they won't repent of their sins and their moralities. And then you keep on going through Revelation and they begin to blaspheme God as the judgments keep coming, all the way to the point where you get to Revelation 19, humanity thinks they can actually kill God, and they want to do it. So they hate God. The more God's judgments come, it doesn't soften their heart. It makes them harden their own heart. And that's why it's so important that we respond to the things that are happening today in a positive way. Don't allow the bad things that are happening in the world to harden your heart. Make it soften your heart. Turn to Christ right now so that you can be a part of that glorious event called the Blessed Hope. We have based our discussion this hour on, as it was in the days of Noah, warnings from Bible prophecy about the coming global storm. You can find that in my online store, Olive Tree Views, views as in viewpoint, olivetreeviews.org. You can call my office, get on our print or e-newsletter list. You can learn more at jeffkinley.com. And again, we carry a couple of his other books, Aftershocks, That's Christians Entering the New Age of Global Crisis. And then we carry an extremely important book, Global Reset, co-authored with Mark Hitchcock. Do current events point to the Antichrist and his worldwide empire? Jeff, I'm veering off topic just a tiny bit here, and my time is also winding down. But your book, on Global Reset, co-authored with Mark Hitchcock. Frankly, I think you've probably written one of the most important books you could by writing on the global reset. And again, as we look at things that are lining up as a countdown to the end of the age, certainly the rapture of the church, but we're not quite at the end of the church age yet because we have the rapture tribulation yet to go through. But this global reset, did you ever think, let's say 15 years ago, that you and I would be talking and you and Mark would be writing a book about a global reset that was going to completely change the way the earth functioned. Now, if we look at the Bible, yes, it would make total sense, but we didn't have the term a global reset until very, very recently. It's like a blurry picture coming into focus. And years ago, we looked at, yeah, this is going to happen, but how might it happen? I think with more proximity to these scriptures being fulfilled, Jan, I think we're able to have a greater sense of clarity and vision as to how they might come to be. And this whole idea of global reset and this book that we've written, 
it's a timely book that's only going to become more relevant mm. with each passing day because we're headed there like a rapidly approaching train towards this intersection that collides with Bible prophecy. So it behooves Christians to really be informed and to not be ignorant about what's going on in the world and what the Bible says about it. Even 10 years ago, nobody knew the name Klaus Schwab. Well, the insiders and the global elite knew Klaus Schwab, but the average person, even though he'd been around since 1971 in a leadership capacity, he didn't come to the surface until maybe five years ago. Today, he's almost a household name. Yeah, and he's growing in popularity. Obviously, with the influencers of the world, he's growing in popularity. They are the ones that make decisions that affect billions. So he really is disciple-making himself throughout these presidents, premiers, prime ministers, yeah. people that are in charge of nations. The pieces of the puzzle, as you've often said, Jan, are coming together. With each new piece, we get a bigger piece of the picture to see. Just a little aside here, still on this Noah's Ark. Do you think it'll ever really be found? I mean, wouldn't it be intriguing if it were without a doubt found in the next week, month, the next year? No questions about it. Clearly and obviously the ark. Interesting timing because it would certainly be another herald of his coming. I had kind of two thoughts on that. And as I wrote the book, I really contemplated this. I thought to myself, on the one hand, if Noah's ark were to be found, it would probably be found very, very close to the rapture happening. Yes. In other words, it would be God's final apologetic to the planet yes. that this happened then and this is about to happen right now. So if it is found, I think it'll be found close to the rapture. On the other hand, I think about what Abraham said to the rich man in hell. He said, if I send someone back from the dead, my friends will believe, give them this miracle. And he said, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. So on the other hand, I think the Word of God itself yes. proclaiming that there was a Noah's Ark is enough evidence for the world to believe because it's powerful and living and sharper than any two-edged sword. Jeff Kinley, thank you for all you do and all you write. I want to go out of the program. I'm just going to say this. How do we respond to a decaying culture and world? Well, here's the exhortation in Matthew 5. And this is to you, my audience. You are the light of the world, a city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in the house. The presence of light in darkness is something that is unmistakable, and I just want to say that the presence of Christians in the world must be a light in the darkness truth of God and his word brings light to a darkened heart, the darkened hearts of sinful man. That is why we are here. That is how we make a difference in these closing moments of the church age. Isn't it a challenge and a privilege to be born for such a time as this? I want to thank you for listening, folks. We'll talk to you again next week. Contact us through our website, olivetreeviews.org. That's olivetreeviews.org. Call us Central Time at 763-559-4444. That's 763-559-4444. We get our mail when you write to Olive Tree Ministries and Jan Markell, Box 1452, Maple Grove, Minnesota, 55311. That's Box 1452, Maple Grove, Minnesota, 55311. All gifts are tax deductible. Our times are in His hands, as the Bible says, so they really aren't out of control. God has all things in control. You are engraved in the palm of His hand, but God orchestrates all that is happening so that everything can fall into place. <laughs>